Hello everyone, welcome back. Today, we're not going to be really doing one of our animals, even though we will talk about animals, but we're going to be talking about ocean zones. This is something that I just kind of had an idea for. I've had to do a lot of studying about this because I did not know as much about the ocean zones as I thought, like different levels of the ocean. So let's go ahead and move on. So first, let's go over the different zones of the ocean. And I have a nice little picture here to help figure this out here. So first is the sunlight zone, okay? The sunlight zone is the epipelagic zone. And the, inside the sunlight zone, there is a small zone called the nertic zone. The nertic zone is the place in the continental shelf here. So right along the sides, like the shoreline, that is where the Nertic Zone is. The, and that's where most like coral reefs and stuff like that, where you'd think of seeing coral reefs, turtles, fishes, and stuff like that. That's There's a lot of life just in this little bit here. And that can be further broken down into the infra latorial zone, the circulatorial zone, and the subtitle tidal zone. So there's like that's all inside the sunlight zone right there. But it just I just broke it down because this place is a very important place to our ecosystem. Then we have the twilight zone, which is the methopelagic zone. Then we have the midnight zone, Beth bathypelagic zone. Then we have the abyss. Like the deep ocean is anything the midnight zone down because light doesn't really get down there. So the midnight zone, the abyss, the uh, and the trenches zone that had a haddle zone. Yep. Those would all be in the deep ocean. And the trenches we're talking about would think of the Mariana Tran Trench, like the deepest place on Earth, I think. And there's a little, like you could see in the abyss zone, you can see the Titanic right there. That shows you how deep it is. About 6,000 meters down. In the Haddle zone, the trenches zone, it is deeper than Mount Everest. And you can see at the very bottom there that the depth that James Cameron reached in his submarine was just about to Challenger's Deep. It was 10,898 meters. The Challenger's Deep is the lowest place of the Mariana Trench. It is the lowest place we think on Earth. And it is about 10,902 to 10,929 meters down. So yeah. And I will bring up this depth chart whenever I get to each place to kind of show you where it is. But let's go ahead and move on. So first, the Neretic Zone, okay? The Coastal Oceans. So whenever you're swimming on a beach or whatever, you are technically in the Nerdic Zone. And this is where it's the most productive ocean zones, okay? 90% of the world's fish and shellfish come from here. So whenever you think of like eating shrimp and like any fish you think of or whatever, it probably came from this zone. Except for like... Actually, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um... So I have a little picture here showing like coral and turtles and whatnot. And the infra infralatorial -lat zone, uh, sorry about that, is the shallow water closest to the shore. And it's mostly where you think of like algae and stuff like that. Like there's probably smaller crustaceans and whatnot living there or maybe possibly smaller fish and whatnot. But like there's not a ton of bigger stuff. It's just small. Circulateral zone littoral zone is mostly immobile or sessile organisms and sponges and stuff like that. This you might start seeing some corals and stuff like that in the shallower wa waters, but most of the corals and sea grasses and like all the other fishes and stuff are going to be the subtidal zone. And just again, here on the ocean depth chart, we are just here on the continental shelf area. And this is most of the stuff that people know about, like right here, just corals of fishes and whatnot. And this is only to zero to 200 feet. 
And I I would have talked about corals more, but I kind of want to do a video just on corals because they're really important to the ecosystem. So maybe look forward to something like that later on. So now we are going to be talking about the sunlight zone, which is still in the zero to 200 range here, but it is not near the continental shelf. It's not near shoreline. This is like over the deep ocean, like over the whole ocean. So anyways, sunlight zone. Here, it's a surface zone, their epipelagic zone. It's zero to 200 meters down, and this is a photic zone. So right now, like, there's a lot of light that can get through. After a while, whenever light hits the water, the reason why the water turns blue or green is because that's the last bit of light that is absorbed. So that's the reason why blue is the last one. So here, there's going to be a lot of photosynth photosynthesis happening. So there's going to be a lot of oxygen, a lot of food for things to eat, everything like that. It's a very productive zone. It's also the warmest layer with abundant natural light and can get between uh, 97 to... I think I messed that up. 97 degrees Fahrenheit to 28 degrees Celsius, I think? It's warm, okay? I think 97 degrees Fahrenheit would be right, but I think I messed that up. Anyways, uh, allergy use sunlight for photosynthesis, yes. Uh, creates about 50% of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. So most people think of like trees and stuff like that making the most oxygen, but it mostly comes from our oceans through just algae. And here it's home to many different types of animals. Whales, sharks, dolphins, fish, turtles, basically everything you think about the ocean, other than like stuff that's in the deep, deep ocean, it's going to be found here. You're going to be able at least to find them here. And oh my. Like, I know some whales will dive deeper down into the depths. We'll talk about those later. But think of just, like, I think these are humpback whales. There's humpback whales, sea turtles, there's a great white there. What not. So now, we're going to be going deeper down. And the deeper down we go, the more interesting organisms I feel like we find. Because they have to figure out certain ways to do things. So, let's bring up our little infographic here. So, now we are in the twilight zone. So, it's about 200 to 1,000 meters down, right below the sunlight zone. Uh, mesopelagic zone is 200 to 1,000 meters down, like I said. And still, it's technically in the photic zone since like the 200 meters, but this is where all the light gets absorbed. Like, nothing will get past this point. So, little light, but enough for some photosynthesis. Uh, here, you will start to see uh, bioluminescent creatures. So, jellyfish and giant squids and stuff like that. So, I have a picture of, I think these are moon jellies, I'm pretty sure. And they are really beautiful, really beautiful jellyfish. I mean, most jellyfish are beautiful, but these just kind of light up and wonderful. Um... So here there are sharp changes in temperature because of the thermocline. So thermocline, you can imagine it as like a barrier where warm water and cold water don't mix. So like, I don't know for sure where the thermocline is in the ocean. I guess it kind of varies probably. But whenever, this is the point where you cross over that. So there's gonna be a large shift in temperature to uh, cooler. Also, the halocline salinity change is going to be very drastic too because there is kind of like the thermocline there's also a place where salt doesn't mix <laughs> and you're going to be like oh is there anything else that doesn't mix and I'll be like uh yes the density of water because it changes as the temperature changes and whatnot and the salinity so the piscinocline is the density gradient the like area where it doesn't mix so there's a lot of stuff that changes here in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> and I I also have a picture here of the TV show The Twilight Zone because I'm like, this is too perfect not to add in. Twilight Zone is such a weird place. So we just need it a little bit. And here in the Twilight Zone is our first organism we're going to kind of outline and talk about. 
So, lanternfish and bristlemouth fish, okay? So, here at the top here, we have a lanternfish, okay? Doesn't look like much, but you can see that there are little bioluminescent spots on it here. So, lanternfish are one of the dominant types of fish in this zone. Uh, there are 245 different species, and these little dots here are called uh, photopores on its side. And it is an organ that appears in luminous spots, and it's used to attract food or camouflage it through uh, counter illuminate illumination because when you think of being down here in the twilight zone you think like oh if you just stay dark and like black and you don't show anything then you won't get eaten but since there's are other things that bioluminesce it is also good to have some luminescence because then you can counter illuminate and hopefully not get eaten i don't know i still think being like dark would probably be better but I, I don't know. I don't know that much about it. Ooh. And then we have this guy here, which this does not look like a living specimen. I could not really find a good picture of one. This looks dead. But this is a bristle mouth. So technically, it could, could be the most abundant vertebrate on Earth. And from hundreds of trillions to quadrillions because they are so small. They are average size about 75 millimeters, which is like 7.5 centimeters. So very, very small creature. And since they are so small, and also they live in such a deep ocean area, we do not know exactly how many there are. So, I mean, if they're just kind of guessing. But, yeah, I, I feel like there probably are tons of them. Just having that small, it... There could be tons. That's about like bacteria, because you think of bacteria like even on just like the top of your skin, like on the top of your finger or whatever, there's probably like millions of bacteria. Just think of those kind of like a bristle mouse here. And they are kind of special in the thing that they can start at male and then switch to female. So uh, it's called a protandrus. protandrus? But yeah. That also helps in the effect that in case they can't find uh, a male or female of their like separate sexes, they could switch to still have children and whatnot. And they are also bioluminescent, which in this dead one here, you can't really see any of its like, photopores or anything like that. But I'm guessing it's probably kind of like the lanternfish there. It probably have little photopores around on it. So that's our first organism we're going to be looking at here. And very interesting, actually. Uh, lanternfish and stuff like that, just the idea of having large schooling fish around, or well, small schooling fish going around the ocean, kind of, I like the idea. Okay, so now, let's bring back up thing here. We have moved from the Twilight Zone to the Midnight Zone here. So it's a uh, thousand to four thousand meters down. This is, looks like the biggest zone here on this map, at least. So, the Beth of Pelagic Zone, also known as the Midnight Zone. Uh, 1,000 to 4,000 meters down, like I said. The temperature rarely changes here, but it is very cool. Like, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's ep epophotic, aphotic, sorry. <laughs> so, no light. There is no light that gets down here from the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone absorbs all that, doesn't get down here. So, there is no photosynthesis, photosynthesis that happens down here. So, no plants or anything like that. And the only light is from bioluminescent organisms, animals. So, sharks, squids, octopuses, anglerfish, dragonfish, and gulper eels can be found around here. Probably still some lanternfish and whatnot that might travel down. But, like, these are, like, some of the well-known ones down here. There is also hydrothermal vents are common here. So let me bring back up my thing here. Since we are at the uh, uh, midnight zone here, there could be, like, some along here or, I guess, on, like, cliffs or something like that. Could be hydrothermal vents along here. 
And these hydrothermal vents are cracks in the Earth's crust underwater, or could be cracks in tectonic plates, whatever. And, oh, sorry about that. They support a unique ecosystem that use chemical energy as, like, food or whatnot. So they are chemoautotrophs. So they'll go through and get whatever energy they can from whatever's coming out of the vents. Which is very cool since, other than that, they would just have whatever's floating down from the surface. So, pretty cool. I would also like to do a video on these... Uh, hydrothermal vent ecosystems because they are very interesting too. That's why I'm only kind of picking out certain things to talk about. But our second organism I want to talk about a little bit is the anglerfish. So the anglerfish, you probably think of the female anglerfish with the little light that attracts its prey and whatnot. But the male anglerfish does not look like this. I have a picture here of the male anglerfish. It is a very, very small creature here. Like, I don't remember exactly how tall uh, s size it is. Probably a couple centimeters, something like that. But it cannot really do much on its own. So whenever it's born, it will try to look for a female. And then it will latch onto the female there, like on its backside. And it'll get like on a vein or something like that, an artery or something. And it will latch on and it'll just feed off the blood. And it will fuse with the female. And you might be thinking, oh, that's probably detrimental. And I mean, eh, it's, he's not hes not a very big guy. So, I mean, he doesn't take very much. But that is good because it's so hard in the midnight zone to find other animals. So, being able to just latch on and just, like, keep producing, like, keep fertilizing eggs and stuff like that and keep having eggs is good. Because if this male, male anglerfish just like whip back off they might never see each other again it might never see another female angler fish so whenever you find one you better latch on <laughs> they are kind of codependent or well the male angler fish is dependent the female could still live on just wouldn't be able to reproduce so so yeah that's our second animal we're going to be looking at here now we are here in the abyss zone Bum, bum, bum. So, the Abyss Zone is where you'd think uh, the wreck for the Titanic would be at. It's like that. Um, it is the Abyssopelagic Zone. It's 4,000 to 6,000 meters down. And this is the last bit before you get to trenches. It's like that. So, this is most of the ocean floor. So... It is very, very cold here. Uh, 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, 36 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And kind of like the abyss zone there, no light is here. There's no, there's very low oxygen because oxygen gets like put into the water through like the movement of waves and the plants that grow there and whatnot. So since there's no plants, there's no waves that can move around the water down here. Very, very little oxygen is put into the water. The only oxygen comes from melted polar ice. So, warm water raises to top, cold water goes down. So, all the polar ice will go to the ocean floor. But, the ocean floor is almost devoid of oxygen. So, most things will be above the ocean floor. If there are some things that go to the ocean floor, it is for very short times. Or they can just live without low oxygen, without much oxygen. So, there are high concentrations of salts, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica. I, I think it's silica. I think I just wrote that again. But yeah, there's a lot of nutrients and stuff down here. But there's not really much to use them, since there's no plants or anything. And we're going to go on to our next organism here, the Dumbo Octopus. <laughs> or uh, Grimpotithesis? Uh, pro I don't know. Whatever. And these you might know from certain things, like you might know from Finding Nemo, or if you're into VTubers and stuff like that, you might know the Taco. <laughs> that is Ina's uh, mascot. I'm pretty sure it's a Dumbo Octopus. It looks like it. 
So, there is almost a title character of Disney's uh, 1941's film Dumbo. That's th why it's kind of named the Dumbo Octopus, because of the ears there. Also, this one kind of looks like it has a little trunk. So, they prey on crustaceans, uh, bivalves. So, like, think of clams, mollusks, and stuff like that. Uh, worms, and copepods. So, they live an average of three to five years. Octopuses don't really live that long. I think the Great Pacific Octopus only lives around seven to maybe nine years, I think. I think seven. But, they range from 1,000 to 7,000 meters. So, they could be found in the Midnight Zone and the Abyss Zone. They can be anywhere in that zone. But the threats to these would be uh, teleost fish, sharks, sperm whales, because sperm whales would come down here and eat uh, squids and whatnot. They can dive down tons of tons of meters. And seals. I guess seals can get down here too. Or I guess seals can probably get to the uh, twilight zone probably and get some. But they do not have ink sacs. They also cannot change colors like some octopuses. So, if you think of the Great uh, Pacific Octopus, it can camouflage on stuff and stuff like that. And it also has ink sacs. These have none of those. So, they just kind of float around and can't really protect themselves other than to try to run away. They are continuous spawners. Since, like, nothing really changes down here very much, they let eggs any time of year. And the hatchlings, they'll emerge fully developed to survive on their own. So they're just like hatched out and they float off on their own. They don't get protected by the parents. They don't get fed by the parents. They, they have to go on their own. But yeah, really cute. I really like the looks of Dumbo octopuses. So now we're to the trenches zone. So, the trench is where you think of the Mariana Trench. And it's 6,000 to whatever you want to think of feet. This goes down to 11,000. Uh, the lowest place we have found in the Mariana Trench is Challenger's Deep, which was the 10,929 feet down. So, kind of like the last couple, no light gets down here. Not even a single bit. It is called the Haddle Zone or the Haddopelagic Zone. It is the deepest region of our oceans. Uh, the Mariana Trench is challenged deep, 6,000 to 11,000 meters. And most organisms here are scavengers or detritivores. So think of isopods, nematodes, and amphipods. And I have a little picture of one of my favorite deep sea isopods here. A giant osteopod. And these things, think of just giant roly polies that swim around the oceans. And they are beautiful. Like this one looks, I can't tell if it's dead or not. I mean, it might be alive. It looks like it might be preserved in something. Oh yeah, it's got a little tag on it. It's probably dead. But yeah, these are just giant roly-polies that swim around and eat things. I have seen a video of one of these. Like, look up a uh, giant sea isopod attack shark, and you'll see a video of it, like, getting onto a shark and trying to kill it. These things are kind of vicious, but I love them. So, the primary producers of this area are bacteria, and they will metabolize hydrogen, methane, or hydrogen sulfide from like these uh, hydrothermal vents and whatnot. And then things would go ahead and eat these. Then there are also uh, heterotrophic uh, organisms, and they'll feed on marine snow. And you might be thinking, oh, it's cold down here. Does it snow? It's not actual snow, okay? It is. Everything that falls from the t like s the sunlight layer down, it is uh, organic detritus falling from the upper upper layers. So like any small pieces of food or I guess like poop or anything that's like falls down from the top layers ends up down here, and they will feed on that stuff. 
Some of the fish species that are found down here are pearlfish, snailfish, and cutthroat eels. And if you have seen any of the like mega movies or whatever, this is the trenches zone, okay? This is where they think that, oh, there is a little area below like the 11,000 meters or something like that, that there are, it was a different ecosystem. So they think that megs were down there and stuff like that, which don't believe everything in that movie or whatever. It's mostly just for fun, but it's kind of fun to think that like, oh, there's still a deeper area of our oceans that's unexplored. I like the idea of that. And I actually just watched the Meg 2 movie just a little while ago, and it, it was not as good as the first one, but it was all right. It had a, a giant octopus, so that was nice. Also more Megs, but. So yeah, these trenches zones or whatever, uh, Mariana Trench is probably the deepest. Challenger's Deep, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about people that have gone down there. So let's go ahead and move on. So let's look at the missions. So, the first manned mission to Challenger Deep was in this ship right here, uh, the submarine. The white one. <laughs> oh, well, they're both white, okay. The white one with black stripes on it. It, it is the deepest known play part of the ocean in the Marianas Trench is Challenger's Deep. Uh, so, night. oh, actually, I can bring up the infographic again. Right down there. It's very deepest there. And I think that's a picture of James Cameron's uh, sub here. This one right here behind me, which I'll have to move myself. Yes, this green one right here, that's uh, James Cameron's. Uh, but in 1960, uh, Jack Spicard uh, and Don Walsh uh, reached a thousand, oh, 10,911 meters. And that's like within the Challenger's Deep area there. And I, they were the first manned mission. So yeah, they're very brave to go down there and something like that. Like it, I'm sure this was like they took all precautions and whatnot. I haven't looked up all, but like it's being the first people to go down that deep is I think it would be terrifying. Now, would I like to go down that far? Yes, I would. I would love to go down there and look through a porthole and look at stuff. Uh, now, the next one we're going to talk about is James Cameron's. He reached the bottom of the Mariana Trench in uh, not sorry, 19, not March 2012. So, he was in the Deep Sea Challenger, which is this I don't think it was actually green, but in this uh, picture it is. And it kind of goes up and down. And he reached 10,908 meters. So, not quite as far as uh, the first mission by Jack Picard and Don Walsh, but he, there's probably other areas that are just a little bit deeper, so he probably did reach the bottom, just not the deepest part of the bottom. So, then this one isn't as interesting, but this is also one that went down pretty far, and I think 7,000 meters is still within our thing here. Yeah, so that still got into the trenches zone. It did not go to the Challengers Deep, but it still went to the trenches. So, June 2012, the submersible Jiao Long? Jiao Long? Hopefully that's somewhere near the right pronunciation. Uh, reached 7,020 meters down. So, those are some of the missions that have been down there. There's not very many that have been down to the trenches area. But there's at least two that have been down to the very bottom. And I think James Cameron went down there whenever he was filming for the Titanic. I think he was also he also took the submarine down there or something. Or I think it was the same sub that he took to look at the Titanic wreckage. Because he was looking for the... He was looking for inspiration for the movie, I think. Trying to look at it. Uh, yeah, that's all we were going to talk about there for the ocean zones uh, might not be the most interesting thing. We got to look at some interesting creatures and I really liked the ocean and I liked learning more about the ocean, like those zones, because there's a lot of weird stuff that happens as you get lower down. And there's a lot more stuff I can make videos on. Kind of like I was talking about the hydrothermal vent uh, ecosystem stuff. There's also whale falls that are like whenever a whale dies, it'll sink down to the very bottom of the ocean and it'll make an ecosystem there for like years and years and they're really interesting too which i should probably should have talked about in here 
but I guess I did. Um, also, I want to talk about corals and stuff like that because corals are, especially now with climate change, are having more drastic effects, coral bleaching and stuff like that because of the oceans heating up, which I, I do want to make an episode about coral, so I won't talk that much more about that. But yeah, that's really interesting stuff. Our oceans are not as explored as you would think, so there are still tons to find. There's probably tons of more creatures to find down there, and I love like listening and learning more about it, and the ocean's just awesome, even though it's kind of terrifying. A couple of my friends are scared of the deep oceans, and I'm I'm all for it. Uh, well, I'm not all for them being scared, but I'm all for like learning about the deep ocean. I love it. So anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this educational video, and I ha have started working on a couple more. So I, I'm i trying to put out at least once a month of these videos. Maybe possibly more if I get more time and I get more inspiration. But so far, that's what I'm going to do for time frame-wise. So thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.